Welcome here, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to ACC, the stream. Nice having you here. Go grab your coffees. Go get whatever you need to bundle up on the couch to, to sit with us and have church together. So thankful that you guys are joining us here today. Here's a word of encouragement that I got from Colossians 3.15. This is what it says. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. God is calling us to peace. You are called to peace and it is for you. I guarantee this is one of God's promises for you and no matter what circumstance you're in in your life, take the peace that God is offering and may he be meeting you wherever you are right now in your life. But I just want to say again, let the peace of Christ be with you and we are so thankful that you're tuning in here with us. Here's a couple of announcements for you while we're doing this. Good Friday is coming up. If you did not know, it's still happening, even in the midst of all of this time. And it will be streamed at 9 a.m. on Friday. Love to have you joining us for that. As well, we are posting so many videos, it's crazy. So if you want to hear Tim, you can. If you want to hear Aaron, you can. You want to hear me? You probably might not. You can. Christy, there are so many videos for you to watch Monday through Friday. We want to connect with you guys, and we are, we are trying to reach out. So that's available to you every day. Go check us out on Facebook, on YouTube, on the website. The worship team is going to be coming up, and we're going to be singing some songs together. And I just encourage you to belt it out with all you got to Jesus, because he wants to hear you. Heavenly Father, we thank you as we enter this time of worship. We say, come and be in the room with us right now, Lord Jesus. You know the situations that are going on right now. Thank you, Lord, that you are above all of this. Would you bring peace in the midst of all of this? Open our hearts to hear your word today, Lord. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh 
team. It was so good tuning in with you guys for that time of worship. At this time, we want to join into another time of prayer and really allow our Heavenly Father to step into our situation right now because there are things happening in your world where it really might feel our lives are falling apart. What we knew isn't how it will be or there are so many unknowns and so many moving parts of our life that are leaving so many of us, nervous, scared, and we want to take this time to say, let's lift these things to God who is above them all, who cares for you. Let's bring to him. He is there with you. And I just want to spend time in prayer with you and say that Jesus is with you. And I do not want you to forget that for one second. So we want to take a moment and pray and really bring God into our situation, into your situation, because he cares. So bow your heads with me, please, as we, as we pray into our situation right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you that you see, you see it all, Lord. You see before the earth was ever formed, you were there. Lord, after this is all done, you are there and you see us. And you see it through, Lord Jesus. God, I pray in your name for your promise right now that peace would ascend in every house, descend in every house, Lord Jesus, that the love of Christ would rest in people's hearts right now, Lord Jesus. Would they feel your hands touching their heart? Touch the hearts, Lord, right now that are worried, that are breaking, that are anxious, Lord Jesus. Bring in your spirit into that room and let your presence be so felt in that room at this time. God, I pray for understanding in the midst of this. For those who look at this situation and say, this is ridiculous. 
Lord Jesus, I pray that you give them gentleness and mercy. I pray for grace, Lord Jesus, for each of us who live with the same group of people day in and day out, much more time spent in close quarters. And I pray that you would help us have gentleness on one another and be kind. And Lord, I pray right now that we would trust you above all in the midst of this. Lord, we trust you with the situation. Lord, we trust you with our finances. Lord, we trust you with our kids. Lord, we trust you with our world, with Sylvan Lake, Lord Jesus. And through this, Lord, I pray that something beautiful is birthed. Lord, I pray revival comes flowing out of this, that your abundance of your love flows out of this, that the abundance of who you are is so clearly seen. Lord, use this to draw us closer to your name because, God, we need more of your presence. We need more of you in our life, Lord. And if this is what it takes to draw us closer, God, I pray that you use this very well to draw us close to your name. And we thank you, Lord, that you are near. Help us trust you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. I want to add my welcome to the service. It's great to be here with you. Uh, the year was 1982. I'd just gotten my license, and I loved to drive and did it whenever I could. One night, my sister and I were on our way home from church. It was a dark night. It was a foggy night. Now, when I say foggy night, I mean foggy night. You could not see hardly anything. There was a dense fog. It felt like a heavy blanket on us. I was driving carefully, but you can only see about 10 feet in front of us. And uh, it was pretty tense in the car. Um, my sister and I were talking in hushed tones, trying to hide the fact that we were both just desperate to get home. Well, all of a sudden, at the front passenger corner of the car, an old woman appeared. Just like that. Boom! She's at the front corner of my car. It was as if she materialized out of thin air like a specter. One second she wasn't there, the next second she was. Her curved spine holding up a withered head. Her old eyes peering helplessly, almost accusingly at me. Her frail body lit up by my headlights. I was overwhelmed with shock. I swerved the car to avoid her. My heart was racing out of control. Now, that would have been terrifying enough. That would have already marked me for the rest of my life. But what you need to know about my sister is that she was a screamer, okay? That girl knew how to scream. And she let out the most blood-curdling scream I had ever heard. The combination of just about killing someone's grandma and my sister's blood-rattling, bone-rattling scream just inches from my head spiked my adrenaline like nothing ever had before or ever has since. Well, somehow we made it home and staggered out of the car, ragged and in tears. I was messed up. I can clearly remember standing by my car the next morning and thinking, I can't get into that car. I can never drive again. I was so frozen with fear. Well, eventually I was able to work it through, but for quite some time, I was pretty terrified. Well, there are all kinds of fears in our lives that can freeze us. Uh, different things. We're handicapped in many ways simply because we can't face the dread of the unknown of a situation. Roads that should be open to us are blocked. Opportunities that we should be able to experience are unavailable. 
Our lives are greatly reduced because of terror. How do we get past a life of fear? Some of you want to know that right now. You want to be past a life of fear. How do we live with courage and confidence in the midst of a world of threat and danger? Well, as is always our practice, we want to turn to the Bible and see what we can learn about Jesus. Today is Palm Sunday. It's the third week in our series called The Road, and we're looking at The Road to Jerusalem. As we read and talk about Jesus' view of fearful things, I'm praying that it'll bring great strength and courage to your heart today. Uh, If you have your Bibles, hopefully you do, on your lap or on your coffee table or maybe on your phone, but turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Um, Sorry, Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to start reading in verse 21. It says this. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Well, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? The first thing this passage tells us about Jesus is that Jesus knew what he was getting himself into. He knew what he was heading into. Four times in the book of Mark, Jesus tells his disciples what's going to happen. He was going to Jerusalem. He would be handed over to the religious leaders. They would mock him. They would spit on him. They would judge him unfairly. They would beat him. And at last they would kill him by crucifixion. Jesus even knew that his own followers, his closest friends, would disown him. And that one would actually betray him. You could not paint a more horrific and undesirable picture if you wanted to. The sense of impending doom that Jesus had to live with is unbelievable. I remember when I would get in trouble as a kid, I know that's hard to believe that I would ever do anything, you know, to get in trouble. But I did do bad things. Uh, uh, My mom would send me to the unattached garage next to the house or have to wait until my dad came home to deal with me. Okay, we called it garage detail. I hated garage detail. It was almost worse than the punishment I was going to receive when my poor, unsuspecting dad came home. There was the unsettledness in my mind. There was the sick feeling in my stomach. And there was the anxiety anxiety of what I knew was going to be a painful experience in my rear end. All All that was for a relatively quick moment of discipline. Well, Jesus had it a thousand times worse. Day after day, he would wake up with this knowledge in his mind. He was going to die. And it would be a painful and violent death. How he kept going is a wonder. Uh, It's just another testimony to his extraordinary character. That's why I love Jesus so much, man. He's he's just so incredible. You know, despite all that, despite all the, the impending doom that he carried, he kept ministering to people teaching them, loving them, and healing them, and caring for them. Jesus is the most incredibly courageous person to have ever lived. But even though he knew exactly what was going to happen to him, Jesus faced the fear head on. If you knew that you were walking into a highly dangerous situation, how might you enter it? I think I would go in as quietly and carefully as possible. I'd kind of tiptoe in, don't mind me, Don't notice me. I wouldn't be able to help myself from trying to limit the degree of danger I might have to face. Was that what Jesus did? I mean, he could have entered Jerusalem discreetly. Maybe there was a way he could mitigate the situation. You know, maybe he wouldn't have to be as bad as he thought. But that's not what Jesus did. He did not go in softly and tenderly like the song says. He paraded in. 
As I said earlier, this is Palm Sunday. This is the day when Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey. The crowds went before him and after him, waving branches, laying their clothes on the ground like a red carpet experience for him, and shouting at the top of their voices, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. The children were squealing and laughing. The religious leaders, they didn't like this. So they tell Jesus to have everyone be quiet. But he would not do it. It was an uproarious parade in Jesus' honor and he let it go unchecked. This was how he entered Jerusalem. If it was today, man, there'd be jets flying overhead. There'd be fireworks going off everywhere. People would be lying in the streets. There was nothing subtle about his entry. It was like he was saying to the religious leaders, if you're looking for me, here I am. And the first thing he does is he clears the temple of all the buying and selling that was going on there. He flips over tables and cages. He scatters all the money that the sellers had been overcharging the buyers for. It is utter chaos. People screaming and running. Animals screeching and flapping and clattering across the stone floors. And in the middle of that storm, just as in the middle of the parade, was Jesus. Again, no subtlety at all. Again, it was a message for the religious leaders and the religion followers. This is not how God wants things to be. I am here to let you know the right way. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law get the message, of course, and they go after Jesus. Round after round, they confront him and try to catch him in his words. And round after round, he takes him down. He makes him look foolish. He leaves them speechless. Now, he must have known that his actions would have stirred up their anger and need for action to a fever pitch, but he didn't go light on them. He had a mission, and nothing was going to stop him from doing what God told him to do. Fear did not intimidate Jesus one bit. He didn't hold back. He didn't cower. He didn't acquiesce. He stood tall and he faced the fear head on. Why did he do this? How did he do this? Jesus knew that the reward for his suffering far outweighed the fear of his suffering. Hebrews 12 says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And Titus says, He gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. He knew that the only way to save us from our sins, the only way to fix the relationship with us that we had broken, the only way to fully realize the extent of his love was to suffer and die except for when he was in the garden. We have no record of him focusing on his death in a negative way. He was so focused on the result of his death and his faith that he would be raised back to life again was so strong that he was able to accept the incredible reality of the suffering he was going to face. He saw the whole picture. He knew the reward was greater than the price. Isn't that incredible? The reward, you and me, was greater than the price. Death by crucifixion. Do you hear that? The reward, you and me, was greater than the cost. Death by crucifixion. This is how much Jesus loves us, friends. This is the extent he was willing to go to reestablish a personal relationship with you. What extent are you willing to go for him. How much of your life are you willing to invest in Jesus? Well, he knew what he was getting into and he faced it head on with courage and determination. Now, if this was a work of fiction, I think there would have been some kind of timely event that would have swept in and kept Jesus from actually having to experience the full scope of his suffering. Just saved him at the, at the last minute. I mean, hadn't the real work been done? Hadn't his attitude and acceptance been exemplary enough? Doesn't the hero get a last-minute reprieve and the story ends up happily ever after? Not in this case. Not in the true story. See, Jesus wasn't protected from his worst nightmare. Jesus wasn't protected from his worst nightmare. There's a scene from the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. 
Uh, Indiana is supposed to cross a vast chasm to get uh, the Holy Grail. I know, very believable. But uh, there's no bridge there. It's a huge chasm, no bridge. And the directions he has to follow, they say, take the step of faith. Well, he's terrified. He's frozen with indecision. If he takes the step, he'll surely fall into the chasm and die. If he doesn't take the step, he won't get the Holy Grail, and his dad will die. What's he supposed to do? Well, after much mental turmoil, he makes up his mind, and in a crazy act of faith, he steps out into the chasm, and he doesn't die because there's a glass bridge there. Who knew? It was like invisible to him, but it saved him. He took the risk of faith, and he was able to cross over and, get, and accomplish his goal. Now, this happens elsewhere in Scripture, too. One time, the Israelite army had to cross a river. It was a raging river. There's no way they're going to cr- get across it. And it looked impossible. They walked right up to it. And you could see it was impossible. And the command of God was said was, if you walk into the water, it, you'll be able to get across. Wow, this was ludicrous. It was crazy. But they do it. They walk in. They put their toes in the water. And the moment they put their toes in the water, it, it parts. And they cross through on dry land. It's a great story. Great miracle. But Jesus didn't get to experience the glass bridge. He didn't get to experience the water parting. He stepped out in faith and he died. Listen to what was prophesied about him almost 800 years prior to his death. Isaiah 53 verse 10 says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Hmm. <laughs> In the Garden of Gethsemane, only minutes before the suffering began, Jesus pleaded with God to not have to go through with it. But he also said, not what I will, but what you will. Sometimes we can think if we just act rightly, God will protect us from all harm. Right? If we just do all the right things, then God has to come through and save us. And then... When harm comes our way, when we get sick, when we lose our jobs, when our relationship breaks down, when the thing we feared the most happens, we shake our fists at God. We say, what was the point of all that devotion then? Why did I serve you so much if this is how you're going to treat me? Why didn't you keep suffering from me? Well, suffering is not a sign that God doesn't love you. It was the Lord's will to crush Jesus. Wow. That takes some effort to get your head around. It takes me some effort. Nowhere are we promised that we'll get a free ride from pain or from fear. In fact, we're actually forewarned that this world will be difficult. We will experience setbacks and sorrows and sadness. We need to be ready for it. Anticipate it. Not surprised or shocked by it. It will come our way. The question is, how will we respond to it? Jesus knew the struggle that lay before him, but he faced it head on with courage and dignity. And the worst suffering in the world happened to him, but he knew something and clung to it tenaciously. He knew how the whole thing would end. And of course, Jesus was victorious over death. Let me continue in Isaiah 53. It says, And the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, And after the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his land. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. And he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. What Satan meant for evil, God turned to good. Despite the enemy doing everything in his power, throwing all he had at Jesus, our Savior was still victorious. There is no evil that can get in the way of God's love. There is no evil. This is what it says in Romans 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the uh, uh, present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So what are you afraid of? Nothing can separate you from God's love. And if nothing can separate us from God's love, we have no reason to be afraid. 
So why is it so important to know all this about Jesus? I know our goal is to become like him, but we're still assailed by fears and challenges. I am. They can feel too big for us, and we're not completely like him yet. We're still like us. We're still afraid. We're still hesitant. There are two reasons why we need to know this about Jesus. First, because the Bible tells us that this very incredible, unflinching, unintimidated Savior fights for us. Boom. He fights for us. He is on our side. He is the one that's um, our protector, our great Savior, our King of kings and Lord of lords. Listen to these verses. Deuteronomy 20 verse 4 says this. For the Lord your God is the one who goes to you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Joshua 1 9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Psalm 44 verse 5. Though you, through you we will push back our adversaries. Through your name we will trample down those who rise up against us. And Deuteronomy 3.22 says, Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God himself will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. And there's nothing that can stand in his way. Come on. He went up against death. Death was Satan's greatest weapon. It was the thing we fear most. Death. And Christ was victorious over it. There is nothing in your life, no fear, no worry, no obstacle that Jesus will not be victorious over. He will stand up for you. He will go to bat for you. He will fight for you. Um, This should give us incredible confidence. We've got the greatest force in the universe on our side and he functions out of love. He is our protector He is our refuge and our fortress. He is our shield and our rampart. He's a strong tower. He's the rock that does not roll. He's the king over every king, the Lord over every Lord. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Nothing happens without his approval. No weapon formed against us will stand. We did not receive a spirit that makes us a slave again to fear. The spirit does not make us timid. Because of Jesus, we can fight giants. We can stand up against opposition. We can boldly go where Jesus asks us to go. We do not need to be afraid. Well, not only do we need to know that Jesus is fighting for us, but his example gives us something concrete to follow. Jesus shows us how we can be courageous. Well, what brings you fear these days? Is it dealing with past hurts? We just don't want to go there. Maybe it's making amends for past sins. You're terrified of the consequences of that. Maybe you need to confront someone in love and you don't want to do it. Maybe you're facing conflict. Maybe it's witnessing, sharing your faith and uh, you're just terrified about doing that. Maybe it's a danger beyond your control like this pandemic. Maybe it's just the unknowns. Here's what the example of Jesus tells us to do. First, uh, we need to know our fear. Do not bury your head in the sand uh, regarding the fears that assail you. Look at them. Understand them. Turning unknowns into knowns can bring great peace. Don't obsess over them. Don't give what you are afraid of more space than it deserves. Dwell on the goodness and the power of God. Think about his strength, his faithfulness, his track record of always coming through for you. Delineate, delineate between what you are truly concerned about and all the add-ons. Here's what I mean by that. When we don't really focus and name the thing we're afraid of, a bunch of other fears sneak in and attach themselves to the one fear. Now we've got this huge load of fears that we're carrying, when really there's only one that maybe earned the right to, to be afraid. So look, maybe your fear is that you're afraid you're going to lose your job. This is a very real concern these days. Well, we need to name it. We need to bring it to Jesus. We need to trust him with that particular fear. If you don't identify it, then here's what else you might think. Okay, here's how it could go. Well, if I lose my job, I'll have no source of income. If I have no source of income, my family will starve and be homeless. And if my family is starving and homeless, I might have to resort to stealing. If I resort to stealing, I might go to jail. If I go to jail, I might never get out again. If I never get out again, my family will be destitute. And if my family is destitute, we'll all die. All right. So that's a bit of exaggeration. But you can see, 
We could add all these extra fears on. Those are a lot of things to be afraid about. But what, they are all what ifs. And they need to be cut out of the equation. They're a waste of your emotional and mental energy. And you don't need to spend another second thinking about them. So you just deal with the one. Deal with the one thing of, of let's say, job loss. Well, how can we think about that? Does God love you? That's very important. When you're thinking about anything you're afraid of, just ask that question first. Does God love me? That answers most of the questions right there. Did he promise to be with you through everything? Did he say that all things work together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose? Did he say that we can take heart because he has overcome the world? Yes, yes, a hundred times yes. And because of that, we can be bold. We can be bold in the face of our fears. So despite how you feel, pray, praise, worship. Declare that God is good. He's working out his perfect will in your life. Fight back with faith. I know Erin posts videos every day where she's singing a great worship song. They're all beautiful. And just turn that on and play that with her. Sing with her. And let that be an encouragement to your heart. Make the decision to do that. Fight back with faith. Casting Crowns has a song called Praise You in the Storm. Uh, here's some of the lyrics. It says, I was sure by now that God, you would have reached down and wiped our tears away, stepped in and saved the day. I was sure by now. But once again, I say amen that it's still raining and the thunder rolls. I barely hear your whisper through the rain. I'm with you. And as your mercy falls, I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. And I'll praise you in this storm. And I will lift my hands that you are who you are no matter where I am. And every tear I've cried, you hold in your hand. You've never left my side. And though my heart is torn, I will praise you in this storm. Ah, oh, man, if that was the anthem of our hearts, that despite whatever darkness and fear and storm we're in, we are deciding that we are going to praise God anyway. Praising God in the midst of suffering is an act of defiance, friends. It's a rebellion against the enemy. It's saying to him, you can do your worst, but my God is still worthy of praise. It's how he will be defeated. See, the enemy is banking on your cowardliness. He is betting that you will be chicken. But we don't have to let him cash in on his bet. We can be bold. And with boldness, we can have faith. Do not be dismayed if your worst case scenario comes true. God has not forgotten you. God has a bigger idea for you. He has not left you alone. Jesus understands exactly what you are feeling. Be willing to lose your life. Be willing to lose. Keep up the faith. God has not betrayed you. It's possible that his plan is not totally revealed to you. It's possible that it can look like he's not in control, but that doesn't mean he isn't in control. And in your faith, look for miracles. Believe that God will do miraculous things through the situation. He can redeem anything. He can turn death to life. He can turn sinners to righteous. He can make anything beautiful. Man, what have people been saying about COVID-19? Some say it's the worst pandemic to ever strike the earth, while others say that the common flu is way worse. Some say we'll get through this relatively quickly, while others say we could be in this for a long time. We don't really know. Time will tell. We do know that we are facing uncertain days. We do know that we have never experienced anything like this as a planet before. We do know that we are walking a road that can be frightening. Now really, only two things can occur. One, everything turns out okay. And all those fears and worries were just a waste of time. Or, what we worst fear comes true. And it comes true whether we worry or not. So again, worry and fear are a waste of time. Instead, put your hope and trust in God. His perfect will is the best option out there. Declare his praise in the face of the storm. Be bold. Have faith. Look for miracles. Amen. Now our habit always, which I love, is um, quietly listening for Jesus' voice. And I, I say that when we gather as a congregation. I say he's here in the room. And he's there with you right now, in your room. He's right there, as he is right here with me. And he loves us. And he has things he wants to say to us. 
So I would like us to be quiet and listen to him. And this time, I just, I would encourage you to say, Jesus, is there anything you want to say to me? So let's go to prayer right now and let's listen. Lord Jesus, uh, there are lots that can, that can frighten us. We're like sheep. Uh, we get startled by noises and we run the other way. The Lord, you tell us to be full of faith, full of courage. Lord, you're the one who fights for us. Well, right now we want to hear from you if there's anything else you want to say. So we're quiet and we're listening. Speak, Lord. All over this town, we're listening. What are you most afraid of these days? What is Jesus saying to you about your fears? How might Jesus want you to live in the midst of your fears? What do you hear him saying to you right now? Lord, I thank you that you care for us as much as you do. Thank you that your, is, yours is the voice that wants to speak to our hearts. These days, we need to hear you, um, ha, I want to say more than ever, but I always need to hear your voice. We always need to hear your voice. Maybe these days, we're, uh, we're more frightened than we've ever been. We're more worried or anxious or unsettled than we've ever been. And that's not bad. I don't really particularly mind that. It uh, draws my heart to you. And so God, I pray that you would use this to draw our hearts to you. We'd focus on you, fix our eyes on Jesus. Thank you that you were brave, that you never backed down on anything. You faced everything head on and you fight for us. Not only that, but you set an example for us to follow that we might be courageous like you. So do that work in us, Lord Jesus. Do that work for your glory, for our joy, and for the hope of the whole world. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right. Well, thanks everybody for being with us today. It's been uh, oh, it's been good to come to God's words to look at Jesus again. I love looking at Jesus, man. He is the best thing we could ever look at. Uh, I want you to be filled with peace and encouragement and joy, grace and mercy and peace be upon you. Here's what it says. Like I read this verse. I read it earlier, but Joshua one nine. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. He's with you in your house right now. He's with you in all that you do because he is great and he cares for us. So be at peace, my friends. Uh, look forward to checking in with you guys on Good Friday. that's coming up this week. So at uh, 9 o'clock, it goes live, and um, we're looking forward to um, worshiping God together. Have a fantastic week.